We'll take the roll call. We'll start with Mr. Wyatt. Bob Wyatt. Paul Rick Straff. Vicki McKinney. Brent. Brent Hose. Vicki Alston. Kimberly McMichael. Philip Butler. There's no more sessions scheduled in August. The next board meeting is scheduled for Monday, September the 9th, 2024. The meeting begins at 6 o'clock at Central Administrative Offices, located at 511 Harrington Highway, Eden, North Carolina. Access the latest agendas from the Rockingham County Board of Education by visiting www.rock.k12.nc.us Board of Education and clicking on Board Meeting Agendas. Now we'll have Pastor Kevin Donovan from First Wesleyan Church in Eden for a moment of prayer. Join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all that have gathered here tonight. And Lord, we just ask your blessing upon this meeting. We ask your blessing upon each board member, Lord, and the things that are before them tonight, that you would just guide and direct them, give them the, the wisdom and direction, Lord, as they uh, lead. We thank you, Father, for just all that you're doing in all of our lives. And Lord, and we just um, praise you for who you are. We ask, Father, your blessing upon all the um, staff here at Central Office and, and then all of those in the school system, Father, as teachers and students prepare uh, to come back, Father, Lord, we just uh, ask for your blessing upon them as a new year, school year starts. We just uh, pray for uh, just a great year, Lord, that, that they will return, students and teachers will return uh, ready, Lord, for a great year. And Lord, we just ask again your blessing upon um, the safety and just uh, for a good year and just uh, everything that happens, Lord, Lord, may bring honor and glory to your name. And Lord, again, we just pray for, for this meeting tonight and ask your blessing upon this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. Now, Mr. Wyatt, will you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Okay. John Man, the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of our country. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America, America and, and to, to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, one, one nation, nation, under God, indivisible, indivisible with, with liberty and, and justice for all. all. Mr. McPherson, would you read the comments about public? Um, Do what? We have to approve the agenda. Oh, okay. That's, that's true. <laughs> okay. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda? I'll make the motion to approve the agenda. We have a second. I'll second. All in favor? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Now, public comments. <laughs> In accordance with school board policy uh, 2310, we will now turn to the public comment section of our meeting. On behalf of the Board of Education, I'd like to express our gratitude for your contributions to our discussion of issues facing our board and our schools. Public comments do not necessarily reflect the views of the board. Board members will not respond directly to individuals who address the board during this portion of the meeting, except to request clarification of points made by the presenter. I have respect for the privacy of our students and staff. Discussion of matters involving individual students or personnel will not be permitted. All speakers will be allowed three minutes for their comments, and we ask that you please conclude your comments when you hear the second week. Thank you to each of you who have signed up for public comment today. Thank you so much. Sean Bradley. Yes, right there. First of all, I just want to start off that um, I just want to address everybody and say hello. Um, the concerns that I'm having today is about the athletes having to pay to play sports. Um, it's something that I'm trying to get more of an understanding of because I feel it's uh, forty dollars. It doesn't seem like a lot, but to a lot of kids that's out there, they may not have forty dollars to play. Plus, I feel like it takes away from the actual sport itself. Like, why are our kids? Subjected to have to pay forty dollars to play sports when it's been free for all of these many years. So I mean, I don't know. I mean, how true it is if it's actually going through. But me having multiple kids that's playing sports, I have a daughter that's chilling now. That's that can add up for them. So I'm just trying to get more of a clear understanding of first of all why are kids have to pay forty dollars, and if so, where is that money going to go to? 
because um, I feel like uh, the athletes they make they make these schools a lot of money, and uh, I just don't feel like that it's a fair shape for our children to have to pay for it and how to play sports. I mean, they work hard not only through school, but they have to try to make these teams. So to make the team and then have to pay forty dollars just to play that, I don't feel like that's that's a fair shape for our kids. So that's mainly why I'm here today because I want to just I really want to get more of an understanding because even as if our kids have to pay forty dollars, what does that mean? What is it going to go to? I'm a I'm a parent that every dollar my accounts that I have to use, they already have to pay for cleats, uh, shoes, stuff for school. My daughter's chilling and have to pay for uniforms. It's so not only that, going to the games, we have to pay admission prices uh, for concessions. That is a lot of money in today's economy. A lot of this is just some bad times out there. So to pay $40 for our kids to play sports, I don't feel like it's a fair shake for our kids. So I don't know so far who so I need to talk to so far to get more of an understanding of that or what you need to do, but that's that's just a prime concern of mine. That if you leave it up to me, my kids shouldn't pay for it on push sports. At all. It's not fair. It's not fair for our kids to pay for it on push sports. I don't know how other parents, I know a lot of parents said that they would be here. Uh, I mean, I just feel like if I have to step up and I have to speak out, then that's what I'm going to do because a lot of people would sit here and say, oh, well, you know, that's all, all of this about what's fair and what's not, but no one's actually speaking out. So until someone actually takes that step and steps up and actually speaks out and speaks up to what's, what they feel is right, then I feel like this something's going to keep on progressing to something worse. So... I feel like it's something we need to go ahead and, you know, we need to get situated and get resolved now. So I appreciate y'all the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Angelica Wall. I'm pretty much. Um, with Mr. Bradley. Um, I have a ninth grade, well, rising ninth grade. And um, I just don't feel that it's fair for them as athletes. I mean, I know times have changed, don't get me wrong. And from when we went to school, we never had to pay for PE uniforms or anything with sports only. Our parents only had to buy tennis shoes if they could or whatever. But you know, um, this past year, uh, my son was out of school due to his attendance, and it was basically more so uh, sickness and a uh, few times the school had called for me to pick him up, but yet they still counted him absent. Well, at the, because of his absences, they were saying that he couldn't play sports, so I had to write a lot of grievances and everything or whatever to, in order. But it, what I'm trying to get at is when he found out he couldn't play because of his attendance, I mean, it just pretty much destroyed him, you know, and, and basically he, um, I have full custody of him and he's going through some things with his parents and that was his outlet, you know, even the therapist was like, you know, if he gets in trouble or anything, you can't take everything from him, you know, sports was his outlet, you know. And just like Sean said, think about the parents that may not have them. I'm a, I'm a disabled vet. I do not work. Um, my husband is the only one in the household that's working or whatever. I'm not saying that we can't afford it, but we just don't feel that it's fair to, to the kids. And, and, and the thing of it is, is, just think about the other kids. You know, what about the other parents that have maybe three or four kids in sport and won't be able to afford it? And you know how kids are, they, they pick at each other. You know, why are you not playing? Oh, your mama didn't have the money. You know, we have to think about stuff like that, you know. And I, most kids, they go to school so they can play sports. That's how I get mine about to be. You know, we got a basketball game coming up, you know. That's how I keep him, you know. You better get to school. You better do your, your homework. You better do your schoolwork and keep them grades up or you're going to be, you know, they're going to know. The other kids is going to know. And, and don't come look at me because this is your responsibility. So that motivates him. So I, I'm just like with Sean, I mean, where's the money going? 
you know, from the concessions. And I know I've been to middle school games and high school games, and they run out of uh, stuff, food, popcorn stuff. So we know they're making money. I mean, my, my son was in a fundraiser uh, this past year, King and Queen. Uh, they said last year it went towards a mascot. So basically that's all I got to say is like, we just want to know, you know, what can we do? You know, I know it's a resources out there, but what can we do? Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we'll move to public board comments. Does um, do you have anything? No. Okay. Do you have anything? Okay. Do you have? Okay, you go ahead. I appreciate what the people had to say, and always I listen to public comments. Uh, early college started today. Kids are apprehensive. Uh, rest of our school is going to be starting soon. Teachers are going to go back to work. They're apprehensive too. So let's just hope everybody has a good school year. Thank you. <coughs> Ms. Rachel? Um, I, I hope everybody has a good school year too. And I, I do appreciate you guys coming and speaking um, about the, I think, Ms. Austin, are you reading the, are you giving information about where that money is going, what it's being allocated to? Oh, I thought mm -hmm. you were speaking to those points tonight. Sorry. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so anyway, there, um, if it's okay, I'll just say Dr. Perkins is um, serving as our athletic director, and he will he can certainly give you information on that as well as us individually too. But anyway, I just wanted to say that I do hope everybody has a good good year. I know folks are heading to we've got students who have graduated and they're heading off to school or work and doing their thing too. So I want to um, send a shout out to them and to our teachers. Mm -hmm. Mr. Huss, do you have anything? No, but thank you. You're welcome. So, Michael? Well, I did want to say um, that I really enjoyed being at the Rock Top ceremony the other day. I thought that was great. And congratulations to those kids who um, graduated, and congratulations to the kids who um, were able to sign on to that program. That is that is great for them. And um, I want to say thank you to the parents who came and spoke to us about the athletic phase. I've gotten a good number of phone calls and um, had several conversations about it, and um, we'll be happy to talk to you about that um, in, in, as individuals in just a little bit. Our policy prohibits us from being able to just directly answer your question from um, you know when you're standing in front of us and so but thank you for being here. Thank you so much for being here tonight. We understand and, and Dr. Perkins will be addressing that I think a little bit later. Um, also, we want to recognize the graduates that graduated this summer in our summer graduation mm -hmm. over at Moorhead, and we wish all of them good luck in their years ahead. And also, the Rocket Top graduation last week was such a success. Thanks to all the parents also that attended the Moss Street meeting, and thank Reverend Therrington for leading that meeting last mm -hmm. week. That was wonderful. And Ms. McKinney and I have been to Moss Street and the telemedicine clinic is going to be up and running soon. They have the room ready, they've painted it, and they're getting it ready. And we are so excited for this clinic, to partner with Cone Health for this clinic, because it's, it will help the students with their absenteeism and their test scores. Bessemer School in Greensboro has improved greatly with the telemedicine clinic, and they've hired a full CNA to be over there five days a week. So that's a, a good thing that's happening. So, and we wish all the students starting back to school and the teachers good luck this year. We hope it's the best year ever. Thank you so much. Okay, do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I make the motion to approve the consent agenda. Thank you. Do we have a second? I'll second. Crazy, or didn't we? Didn't we agree that we're going to um, not give 
classify the employees or raise without doing the whole thing? I ask you that question. Yes, uh, we're, we're, all we're doing is giving people steps or the okay. state mandated raises. Okay. Yeah, that's it, nothing else. Okay. We haven't done any reclassification of anybody or anything of that nature. So we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll move on to action item 7.1. Dr. Perkins, instructional materials. Good evening, Madam Chair, Board Members of Stover. I come to you tonight seeking your approval of our um, instructional materials. Policy 3200 requires us to, uh, to review and assess and then bring to you for approval uh, our instructional materials. You'll notice that um, the big item on here you already, already approved earlier this year with our textbook uh, adoption. Uh, there's also some things that you approved tonight in the consent agenda. Uh, the, uh, Veronics and malware bytes in this entire. Um, but our list of instructional materials has uh, really consolidated and, and lessened. Uh, we have cut the uh, New Zella, uh, Discovery Tech Books, uh, Pear Deck, Delta Map, uh, Screencastify, we reduced just to a, a handful of site uh, or district uh, subscriptions. We don't need one for every teacher anymore. And we're going to do the same for Zoom. So if you look at Zoom, I think that price is fifty-six thousand. We that's last year's uh, contracted price. We expect that to really go down as well because we're only planning to purchase uh, fifty uh, subscriptions for that. So each school can have one, and then we can have some for the district as well. Um, but we'll be glad to answer any questions that you may have. You'll notice in blue the items listed in blue. Um, the contracts don't expire until later in the fall, so we're still waiting on those invoices. The, the call should be relatively um, similar to what is listed there. Do we have any questions? I have one question. Okay. We've asked in the past, but there's no way to track <clears throat> how much each program is being used, correct? Uh, and yes, we can we can track usage um, from things like um, iReady and Achieve 3000. They have a really robust program that allows us to see usage and we send that out to our schools each week. Um, some of the other things, the discovery tech book was, was more difficult uh, to track. Um, but our main resources that we have now, especially our ready and achieve, we do have a good way to track that usage. And every, all the schools that's being used district wide? Yes. So some schools aren't using this one, and, and some schools using well, another program? This discovery and uh, our ready are elementary and middle school resources. Right. Uh, so some of the high school resources, like New Zella was um, a district-wide resource. Um, Discovery Tech Books was a district-wide district, district -wide resource. But now we, we have basically um, eliminated most of those. Um, for the high school, you'll see specific things like IXL Learning um, and uh, Prep Factory that are specific to the high school, um, either subject or um, things like the ACT. So um, very few district-wide um, resources that we have. And we brought that, it, it's down to 4.6. What was it? It, well, it was added. actually over more than 3 million last year, but remember, we added that big purchase of, of 1.2 mm -hmm. um, for the, um, the textbook. And we're going to maximize the ESSER monies uh, we have until September 30th. And we met today to talk about that. We have, we'll have a little left over that we, if we can move some of these items into 181, we're going to save as much. Our local and state money is okay. Anybody else? Yeah, yeah. I just want to. I just want to clarify something. Um, and I appreciated you speaking with me, Dr. Perkins, about um, some of these things. It's my understanding that um, Imagine Learning Edge Edge Annuity is is a pilot that we're piloting that as co credit recovery right. versus um, what we. We have been using um, APEX, which is one right above that at Mentum, for years. Uh, Edge Annuity is a pilot this year at SCORE, and we do think it's uh, a little better resource than what we currently have. There's a lot of other features that, that, it, that it offers. Um, they have a, um, a price that's by usage, so the way APEX works now, we give each school X number of slots, and that one slot allows one student to take up to four courses. 
um, and they price by those number of slots. Ingenuity has doesn't have a set scale like that, so it will be interesting for us to see how um, how they do price that because SCORE for the most part uses mostly online material for their for their construction because of how few teachers they have. There. So we'll have a better look after this year to see if that's something that we need to look at for the future. Um, the, the contract for Apex does end at the end of this year. We were on a three year. Uh, contract with them and that ends at the end of this year. And Mr. Rice is going to speak about that a little bit in his oh, presentation okay. as well. Sorry. Sorry. Madam Chair, I make a motion that we accept um, action item 7.1 for the instructional materials. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Stover, transportation fees. Good evening, board members, Madam Chair. Let me get to the right point. The reason uh, I am uh, here to ask for your approval to raise our bus driving fee from um, 150 to 175. Uh, Mr. Cox created a document of justification and made some recommendations. And as you can, if you look at that document, you see I didn't actually follow the recommendations, one of the three tiers. We met as a team and, and thought that 175 was the fair price that allows for um, us to fully fund the GPS part of it. And that's what we really want to pay for. This allows us to know exactly where our activity buses are at any given time. Uh, we didn't have that. We have that for our regular yellow buses. We don't have that for our activity buses. And so the addition of the fee does that, plus some rising costs that we have. Gives us a little room. Uh, one thing I do want to make, um, make you aware of is that in our rental fees that you previously approved, uh, we had a section in the middle for um, um, uh, non-school and public agencies that were a benefit of students. Um, previously, we had actually been charging them a small fee, um, and the new uh, the new fee schedule that you approved last meeting, we don't have any charges for that. Um, we're going to have to uh, this keeping with our policy of making sure that we don't. Um, our goal, let me see, not policy. Our goal of making sure that we don't charge any more than we need to, that we recover our cost, and that's it. We might come back to you. We just want to make it where we come back to you um, with some recommendations. Um, and they could be exactly the same as they were um, previously, those fees, or we could go a little bit lower, a little bit higher. We're going to get everybody together to come up with the right fees. I think there's been some miscommunication. Um, at the very, there are for for-profit groups that are there to charge and make money. The, the fees for use of facilities like the um, athletic fields, they are $100 an hour. But that is for those folks who are really who want to come in a for-profit driven and use the fields. It is not for folks like Reedsville or, or Eden Youth Football. We, we're not we're not charging them $100 an hour to use the field. They would fall under that middle column of community of, of groups and for the benefit of our students. So I want to make you aware of that there's really nothing for you to do or approve. I just want to give you that update. Good. Can I ask a question? And yeah. and I know that our, our folks, the one of the questions I feel like I can answer this now. <laughs> Okay. Um, with our athletic fees, um, all of those are going are collected by the school. The schools have control over all of those athletic fees, and they're going to make the decisions on what to spend them on. We have provided some guidance on what you can spend. It's basically anything athletically related to the benefit of the students. And so, the central office doesn't have any of that money. All that money stays at the school, not necessarily for the sport. We're going to trust our schools to use them in areas where where they need and. You know, the way I look at it is if you play YMCA soccer at five years old, you're going to get some, charged some fee. And, and what we're trying to do is keep our athletic programs viable because I see them as a huge part. I think um, one of the folks who, the last person who spoke, talked about the effect of maybe possibly being on the team is. And I agree with that. That's well said. Um, we need, we want to make sure our programs are strong going forward. And this small athletic fee that covers all sports, one-time fee for all kids, we think does this, provides the schools with some money um, because costs continue to rise like everything else. And so I wanted to clarify where the money was going to, to the board, that, that it's going to stay at the school um, for the benefit of the students. Dr. Stavis, I have a couple of questions. So um, on the mileage fee, 
<clears throat> the schools, the the activity buses are sort of a fee for pay for service. Yeah. We charge per mile because we we have to pay for those activity buses out of local funds. Thank you for thank you yes. for explaining that. And then the state nor the local funds go towards pay for paying anything that are directly athletic related. No. We've gotten several phone calls. People didn't understand that the state doesn't fund anything for athletics. The constitution only provides your right to a free public education, not for anything athletic. So everything that people have received up to this point has just been on the um, has been at the expense of the school district, correct? Yes, um, that and then also those concessions, the entry fees, it has to be self-sustaining um, in as much as, as we can make it, the athletic programs. Uh, we li uh, rely on our boosters and other um, means to um, pay for the uh, programs. So, okay, so I'm, I'm, gonna I'm gonna try to ask questions that help you get those answers out there. Okay, great. Okay, so the gate fees stay at our schools and our and that is up to our athletic directors to help decide where those, along with the coaches and whoever at the school, they help decide where that money's spent, correct? Right, it, with the exception of the middle school uh, championships, we actually use the money from those gate fees to pay for the athletic banquets. Okay, and then the all of our concession stands are operated and the money that is made there is collected by boosters and the school district does not have a right to tell a boosters club what they can and cannot do with their money. Those are completely separate from the school district, that's correct? Right. Yeah, that's correct. We're not in the business of, uh, of, if we are in the business of selling things, I think it, another level of, of requirements and support so it's actually better well we just don't want people to have the idea that we're yeah. making that money off right. of the concessions and just it is the and just keeping it but they use it at, for the benefit of the students mm -hmm. and the and the I'm just trying to think of all the different questions that have wait oh, so could you please speak a little bit there was mention of um, He's about a waiver. There is a mention of a waiver, um, but you're saying that, but that every slot that is a, an athletic position held, that those positions are going to have to be paid for from somewhere. Yeah, and I'm going to um, might ask Mr. Uh, Dr. Parkins to come up and clarify that, so I don't misspeak on that yeah. one point. Thanks. <laughs> I thought it was if a, if it's if a student plays multiple sports, they only pay forty dollars one time. That is correct. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Right. They only pay one one time, and it covers all sports for the whole year. Um, but we do offer a hardship. We're not calling it a waiver because waiver means you don't have to pay. Someone is going to have to pay for that. So it can be the school, it can be the booster that they choose. We're not mandating boosters. It can be the team having a special fundraiser. And what we recommend to the athletic directors is to plan, you know, an extra car wash or something like that on the afternoon. It might take, you know, three, four hours of your day, but you could, you know, raise the funds to cover for any students that, uh, that, have, that have a hardship. Uh, any parent that has a hardship request, they can fill it, submit one to the principal or the athletic director. Um, hardships can be anything from a payment plan uh, to an actual, you know, hardship request where, you know, the team picks up that, that, that coverage for them. Um, but we've really encouraged our principals and athletic directors to, to be, um, you know, very flexible with the parents in, in their unique situations. We're, we're, our intent is we're, we're not going to keep any student who wants to play and makes a team from playing. We're going to figure out a way to help fund that. And, and just another thing, if I could add this, the, the cost of everything from, from transportation, uh, insurance, the officials, all of the officials across the board and for the, the state of North Carolina got an increase in pay. Um, the supervision, the, the weapons detection supervision and, and, and security that we offer, um, all of that costs money. And um, it's, it's unfortunate, but uh, other districts are doing it as well. And um, you know, we, we wish we did not have to, but in order to have quality athletic programs, um, we have to have a funding source. Where it is. So can I ask a couple more questions? So um, it's back to the the rental phase of the facilities. So you said that groups like the Dirty Birds, the the Tigers, as the Reedsville Tigers, um, the I can't remember what it's supposed to be called now, RCYFL, and then um, the Prowlers. Those groups 
you said that it was by the out under the middle column so no charge for those groups right now, for yes. their practices during the week yes. and for their games on saturdays yes. but i believe you said that if like a game were to be kicked over into an evening which most of those most of those groups are done with their games by three o'clock in the afternoon but should something fall over to the evening there would be a fee just for the electricity that's used right for that for right now no because that's not on what you've approved um, but we're, we anticipate coming back to you for saying that this is what we need um, either in September or in October. We want to make sure that we give you the right information. Uh, so, yes, the intent is for right now because you haven't approved it and uh, we're not charging them. But to your point, they don't really need it at this point. Um, but we, we want to make sure that we're charging the accurate cost. And so it's just the facility rental and uh, many of these groups have paid us previously they're used to that and so we're going to go back and that was a little bit of a miss we're going to go back and look at that and make sure that um the the, the goal of our fees is met that we're not we don't want to make any money but we we have to recoup our costs at the school district level any more questions no but oh. it, it's a tough sale and y'all know the the financial part of it and and I don't and I know it's a lot more than than I think and I I can certainly sympathize with uh, parents we were very deliberate and we, we talked about this a lot um, I think the goal of maintaining the programs for our students because I believe and everyone on the leadership team agrees that having these after-school athletic opportunities as well as our clubs our robotics all those things are really important. And I wish we were in a position that we could supplement local money for the athletic programs, but we're not in that position right now. And we want to keep them viable, and we thought this was a minimal fee to do so. And the way I look at it is, is almost all of the, and that's everywhere. If you participate in youth sports, there are some hardship requests, but you have to pay a fee um, everywhere. And that's per sport. We're trying to do it per student only, so they can pay. You know, many of our students pay for sports. And it's just a one-time fee. Anything else? So, I just would like to go back to the transportation um, issue as well with the activity buses. So based on what I was reading, it's my understanding that in conversations that I had with Mr. Cox, it's my understanding that about two-thirds of our activity fleet needs to be replaced that based on age of the vehicle and mileage of the vehicle. And so um, my question is, do we have, and if we don't, can we work on, can we develop a rotation for replacing those buses? Because I know we did that a while back for the trucks, for maintenance and, and all. So yeah, we've got 30 buses that are in service. Um, I think there's 12, there's four that's turned 20 this year and then eight that are already 20 years older and over. So to be on the state on the state replacement cycle, every 20 years or 250,000 miles, we should be trying to replace those. So we should be purchasing one every other year and two every other year to kind of get into that guideline. But we would have to get some sort of fund built up where we could do that. So, so it's my understanding that the state does not pay for activity buses. It only pays for the yellow buses. Yellow bus. So we we have to generate the dollars for the activity buses. Everything. So, yeah. so I under, and I understand the. Um, so I, I want to. I just want to weigh why you decided to go with the one seventy five versus the two dollars. Help me with that. Um, the, the factors that we looked at is that we had done an increase not last year but the year before. To 150. Okay. Uh, we know the biggest users of our activity buses are our athletic programs, and if we're charging the fee for athletics as well as increasing the, uh, we're kind it's of like defeating weight. the whole purpose. And so we wanted to, like, um, Mr. Cox presented a, a, a need that he really had, which I agree with. There's lots of value in knowing where those buses are, pinpointing if something should happen. We have that information, um, and we wanted to try to go a little bit above it, but not too much. Um, and so we came up with 175. We thought that was not as big a burden on the schools um, to, to find the funding for this um, and met the needs of what we have. It does not move us towards having building up funds to replace those buses. That, that is correct. Well, I do think we need to be diligent in making sure that we're developing, we're, we're doing something 
to plan for those buses or else. I mean, that's yeah, uh, that's a good point. Yeah. I will, I, um, Ms. Young, Mr. Cox, and I will work on that so if we can do a presentation once okay. we have some to the board. Okay, some Thank ideas. You. Thanks. Any other questions? Do we have a motion to approve the transportation fees? Madam Chair, I'll make the motion that we approve the transportation fees, um, but I would like to add to that motion that we um, begin to work on that plan. Mm -hmm. And I'll second that motion. Thank you. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Uh, uh, opposed? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Ellis, RFP. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, board members, Dr. Stover. Sorry. Okay, tonight we would like to update you on our progress toward issuing an RFP for banking services. The last time we issued this type of RFP was back in September of 2020. Our board has expressed interest in issuing another RFP this school year. So to accomplish this, we would like to take the RFP from 2020, which is attached um, to the to board docs, to our finance committee on August 22nd for their review. The committee will revise it as needed to ensure that we are meeting the expectations of the board. And then our goal is to release the revised RFP by August 30th. The Finance Committee would then review the proposals and bring a recommendation to the board no later than the work session in October. Okay. Mr. Huss, do you have any questions? So that's proposing to bring it back to the board as the Finance Committee looks at it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, For some reason no, I'm it. sorry. I'm sorry. No. So we would review it on August the 22nd, make any revisions as needed, issue it August 30th per what the committee decides and then review the proposals and bring the recommendation to the board September in October. In October. In October. So we, we don't necessarily have to have board approval to release the RFP but we will have the finance committee's um, ex ex experience and um, expertise to look at the RFP to make sure that we are um, requesting the information that we need to make sure we get you the information that you need to make a decision. All right. So, so. Is that good? Sound good? Sound good? Okay. Grant that as a report, uh, not to be voted on today. So uh, yeah. it, it sounds sounds like uh, what we've got in mind. And the reason, one of the reasons too, is because we want to do this expediently. And given that our next scheduled meeting is not until September because we don't have an August work session, we thought going through the finance committee kind of got us on the road to being quicker with some board oversight. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Tonight we have Dr. Kenlaw with us from RCC. Thank you for coming tonight to do your presentation. Thank you for having us. We're so glad you're here. Well, good evening. I, I want to thank you um, on behalf of our college uh, for inviting us to uh, present to you. I can tell you, I've, I've been at the college almost 10 years now, and we've had a really good relationship with the public schools, and that has, that has even grown stronger over the years, and that's going to be very, very important as we go forward um, from my perspective as we address workforce issues. And so, um, of course, Dr. Stover and, and I and, our, and, and, and those that we work with uh, have been at the table a lot. Um, and uh, I think we've got some good ideas about some things that we'd like to do, but there's things that we are currently doing. You mentioned Rocket Top, early college. Those are just two good examples of the partnership that we have. So I have Ms. Sheila Regan with me. She's our uh, VP for Academic Affairs. We're going to tag team on this. I'm going to get it started. I'm going to turn it over to her, and then I'll, I'll come and chime in uh, some as well. But uh, so I want to talk first about something called Propel NC. 
Um, this is an initiative that the presidents uh, in the community college system uh, have, that's really the marketing um, slogan for what we're trying to do. So we formed a work group of eight presidents, I was one of them, uh, about almost a year ago to start looking at how we're funded. And that's very important for what uh, we're going to talk about, more especially when we start talking about workforce issues. Uh, we have a model that is really out of date. Uh, most of our uh, funding is based on enrollment. Uh, the great majority of it is. But we need to change how that uh, is working. And so what we've been, uh, we started on this path a few years ago where we, uh, we sort of went to a tier system so that students that are in nursing, for example, would, uh, that student would be funded higher than someone who's in an English class, for example, or a history class. I taught history, I'll use that as an example. Because it's a lot more expensive to run a nursing program and to pay the nursing faculty than it is to, um, to have a history class, for example. So we have um, spent a lot of time in the last several months taking a look at Department of Labor statistics. And what does this, what do the, st the statistics show in terms of uh, the growth in the future? Where, where are the jobs going to be? And what is the growth rate? And what are the salaries? And so we have asked for um, the General Assembly to consider a new funding model that we would be funded based on 14 different workforce sectors. Healthcare One would be an example, and that would be nursing, radiography, those types of programs that are, that are much more expensive and more expensive to get program directors to, to pay for the equipment, all those different types of things. It's a totally different business model. But that's going to be important for us as we try to address workforce issues uh, in this county and, and, and part of the, and of course, in this region of the state. So we have asked that um, of the General Assembly. It's been well received. I think that they will fund that over a period of time. And that'll put us in a position uh, to be uh, much more able to address where are those workforce needs in our county and be able to have the funding to, to, to take care of it. So that's really what Propel NC is all about. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Regan now and I'm going to come back up and talk facilities when we get to that. Good evening. Um, so just as a reminder, can you just as a reminder, there are three ways that a high school student can take college courses and earn credit. The Cooperative Innovative High School, which we have a very robust early college high school, but that high school is focused on transfer programs. There's a CCP College Transfer, so you can stay at your home high school and take college transfer courses. And there's a CTE pathway. So just a, a little, little data. In green, I want you to look at the green. So Rockingham County Schools transfer the number of students. I want you to take a look at that first column. We're doing very well in that pathway. The far right column in green, we're doing very well with our early college high school. Okay. The other column represents Bethany and some of the home schools that take transfer. But just collectively, if you look at those numbers, we're doing very well with college transfer courses and pathways. I want you to look at the career technical education column. And compare that those numbers to transfer. And we're not doing very well in CTE and getting our students to pursue CTE. And we feel like we're missing a population of students in our county that want more applied and hands-on training and educational pathways. So as a result of that, we, Rockingham County Schools, our college and economic development, wrote a grant to the Golden Leaf Foundation to focus on CTE. Okay, and so the goal of this grant, and we, we named it Level Up Rockingham, it's really a K through 16 uh, pathway if things are going to happen at every grade level. Um, but what I want to focus on is at the end of that, Every high school graduate is going to have a workforce credential to go to work or college credit. Okay. Every high school graduate. And so when we looked at the labor data, labor data, in our region, advanced manufacturing, skilled trades, and healthcare, that's where the jobs are. 
the jobs that pay a good salary, where you can raise your family with these wages. So our Golden Leaf Foundation grant is going to focus on those three workforce sectors. I mentioned that Level Up Rockingham is a K through 16 plan, but I think there are three important elements of Level Up Rockingham. I want to talk a little bit about each element. Career development plans. Lana Walls and her team, um, she tells me they're going to start in elementary school, but there's a hardwired plan to start in middle school with Paxton Patterson, where we expose students to career exploration and assessment. And as you know, I did not know this was statute until Ms. Walls shared it with me, but all middle and high school students must have a career development plan. So you're starting earlier in doing the exploration and the assessment to fine tune where that student's interest lies in middle school. The second major component, I believe, for Level Up Rockingham is program alignment. So we need to have programs at our college align with where the jobs are. Our programs then, your, your programs need to reflect our programs and where those jobs are. So this is small, and I'm sorry for the audience. Um, I don't know how to make it bigger here, but, but you can see it, right? Mm -hmm. So you can see in middle school that Paxton Patterson is going to be that place where students dig in and do career exploration, and they'll do assessment to target their interests and skills. In the ninth and 10th grade, we're, we're identifying courses based on those three sectors, advanced manufacturing, healthcare, skilled trades, where we can introduce this career. And they can do the coursework in high school to be prepared that when they move to the CCP program as a junior or senior, they're ready. They've met requisites. They can read, critically think, and do the math required for that CTE program. Now, in green, on our CCP RCC call, we have credit programs, certificate credit programs, a, a, a credential, but we also have workforce pathways. And when a student pursues a workforce pathway, I have those in green, they often earn a credential. They take an industry recognized exam and they earn a credential to go to work. Okay, now in green, in green, we have not got those approved for our, uh, for Rockingham County Schools yet. It, it's in the works. These are the programs, the skilled trades, the health care, and advanced manufacturing programs we intend to um, offer CTE students. I just want to take like 30 seconds and let all that seek in. Right? Career development plans, very important to introduce students, to get them introduced to career exploration early. In the ninth and 10th grade, take those foundational courses that align with advanced manufacturing, healthcare, and skilled trades, and then come to our college, get in a bus, bring them to our college, and let us be the hub for this training. And so when they finish high school, they have a recognized credential, they can go to work, or they can continue at our college and earn a two-year degree. Career development plans, aligning programs, your program, our program, workforce sector, and the other important element, updated facilities. And I'll hand it over to our president. And just to follow up with a couple of things that she said, we had Cone Health on, on our campus today, and we were talking about the needs that they have in health sciences, and they cannot find the staff. It's not just nursing. It's even people to run their facilities in terms of in the, in the business offices that they have and also HVAC personnel, those types of jobs. They need staff. So the, 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 the money that I, the, the funding that I was talking about earlier is going to be important for us to, to be able to pay for these types of programs. And that's that's why we're pursuing as president. So we have, uh, at the college, we spent a lot of my time here in 10 years updating facilities, whether it's aesthetically or uh, build new buildings, total renovations. We've done a lot. You know, we have a new simulated hospital. That was 2016. We've renovated a lot of other facilities. But our biggest project is is our workforce development center, uh, which is on schedule now. We, we start classes Wednesday. Uh, we will start classes in that building. We do have occupancy. 
Uh, the contractor still in the building will be there probably in the next two, two more, two to three more weeks. Uh, hopefully by Labor Day they're out of there and we're good to go. We will have a grand opening September 26th. You all will be invited. We'll look forward to having you there. Um, but we're really excited about this project. It's a $26 million project. It's a 42,000 square foot facility. Um, and it will greatly enhance what we can do in advanced manufacturing. I really feel good about where we're headed with that. Uh, there are good jobs out there. Just a couple of indoor uh, pictures here. The one on the left is the, is the lobby. The one on the right is the corporate, uh, is the corporate meeting space, uh, which will seat about 200 people. And the seating in there is not fixed, so you'll be able to move tables around as you want to. We'll have a, we have a kitchen where uh, if you want to have um, a caterer to come in for events, but we'll open that to the public and we think that will be used uh, a lot. So we're, we're very excited about this particular building. I'm going to let uh, Ms. Regan talk about the, um, you want to talk about what's, you, you want me to go ahead? Okay, the, uh, the academic programs that are, uh, that are in there are computer integrated machining, as you can see, electrical systems technology, mechatronics engineering. I think she's going to speak a little bit more in detail about those programs. We've got uh, our small business center will be in there and also customized training because we do a lot of customized training with industry. So those offices will be there and I mentioned the corporate meeting space. So that's what will be housed in there. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a very nice facility. I think you will be very impressed with it. What we hope will happen is that the, uh, it will be an attraction for students. Um, it's also, uh, I think, is, is something very good for, for our economic development office because when industry comes in, we can tour them through that facility to show where the training is going to take place. And so uh, we feel like that's going to be very important. A couple of other, uh, I'll, I'll turn this over to her now. She's going to talk to you about the, the individual programs and, and the skill sets that are, that are in them. So if you recall, we, uh, the machining program we had at Reedsville High School, we we're doing on our campus, effective the fall. And this program or this space for computer integrated machining um, completely transforms how we can offer that program. There's a, on the right is the computer lab where they draw the part that they make with the machines on the left hand side. But if you can see the windows, before we had two rooms between our computer lab and our lathes and mills. So this setup allows some students to be working on the machine and some students to be in design phase. It's a much better setup for, for this program. Um, the last time I checked enrollment, I think we had six students enrolled in the high school pathway, so they'll be coming to our campus. I hope to see six more students by Wednesday. <laughs> but computer integrated machine. Um, the other program, our newest program, is Mechatronics Engineering Technology. On the right hand side, you see pneumatic trainers, and our students built a lot of that, a lot of those trainers. The photo on the left represents our automation and robotics lab, and there are two more labs that same space down the hall. So we're going to be able to offer these programs at a much higher level, and we're going to be able to serve more students because we have the space and the equipment. Student space in classrooms, it was very important that we created a space where students felt comfortable. We want them to stay all day, get there at 8 o'clock and leave around 4 or 5, just like the job would entail. So we've created a lot of student space in, in this new building and the uh, photo on the right represents a standard classroom. The other building that we renovated, um, Industrial Technologies I believe was built in 1973 and we have gutted that building where we have put welding in there. So we were, um, we, could, we had 17 welders in our old space we're moving welding to this building where we can accommodate 40 welders. Um, this represents the booths. So we have two labs, 20 welding booths in each lab, and this represents one welding booth. That's about four times the space that the students have now to weld. It, yeah, really impressive. Student space in industrial technologies too for, for welders. So we anticipate having 40 kids in that building at one time. So it was important to give them space to take a break, to recharge, have a meal. And then the photo on the left represents a standard classroom. So any questions about facilities? So three components to level up Rockingham, career development plans, and not, don't just check a box. Don't let students just check a box, Ms. Wall. 
because they have to do it. Um, program alignment. Program alignment. Make sure they're in those high school classes that align with our programs, and our programs need to align with where the jobs are. And then thirdly, updated facilities. I'll close with um, career technical education is expensive. I'm going to let that sit for a minute. Okay. Propel North Carolina is very important that our General Assembly funds that. It requires higher salaries for our faculty. And, and you learned uh, with your nurse aid programs that you just could not afford to pay an RN to work in public school education. Higher salaries for faculty. It's expensive equipment for training. To do it right, you need the state of the art equipment. You need the equipment that students are going to see when they go to work. And then thirdly, you have to pass a certification exam and a credentialing exam. It's just required for employment. So it's going to cost the student more to pursue these programs. So for Level Up Rockingham to work, for this cross-county collaboration to work, I call us the big three, but we need the community and we need employers to sign on to help with equipment, to help with credentialing exams, to help with faculty salaries. It, it's going to take a cross-county effort. So any questions for us? Comment. We're dealing with 16-year-olds that don't know what they want to do. They, they don't know what the real world is. You've got plenty of room for expansion. So the problem that I see is making sure that we get the, the right people, the right students motivated to go and, and take advantage of it. I agree. Well, pa Paxton Patterson, the work that yeah. the CTE folks are going to do um, will be critical as they're moving from 7th to 8th grade. That's where we're going to capture that student. It, the Envision event where we bring all 7th and 10th graders to campus, when they walk through that new building in October, it's going to resonate. Mm -hmm. I think career technical education is going to be on the uptick. And keep in mind, the school system has applied for another cooperative innovative high school that is career and technical education focused on our campus. That is a big deal and it's sitting in the General Assembly now to be, to be funded and we need the General Assembly to fund that because then those students are on our campus starting in the ninth grade and then that, that makes it a lot, uh, we can be a lot more effective working with them as a group. Um, but we're committed as a college to supporting that, providing the space, and I think that would be um, a real big step forward for us. But, but to your point, uh, we've got to start early, and I think that's that's the model that we that we've designed because our our students and the, and the, their families need to know what those opportunities are. We're going to do college transfer well. We're not going to back off from that. But our core mission. Is, is, is addressing workforce. That's why the community college system was, was built. That's what it's built upon, and we need to make sure that we're doing a good job with that. That's the one thing I worry about, is getting more students in career and technical education so they're ready to go to work, and they stay here, and they get the jobs that are here. So anyway, we appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to present to you. We appreciate your support. We've got a good relationship with you, and we, we look forward to continuing that. Thank, Thank you. you. We appreciate RCC. You. you do a great job with the community. Thank you so much. Mr. Rice and Mr. Hyler. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for having us here and um, Thank you, sir. He's getting me all set up. <laughs> um, to talk about Booker T. Washington and where we've been and where we're going. Uh, while he's getting that for me, I'd um, like to say thank you to uh, Dr. Perkins, Dr. Stover, um, Dr. Hyler, and Dr. Corkinham. For over the past two years, we've been doing some work behind the scenes already, visiting other schools across the state. Um, I've been going to several conferences to learn about different things about alternative education. Um, I'm now serving on the executive board for North Carolina for alternative schools and going to be going to the national conference. So we've been gaining a lot of information that we are pulling together to now move forward with 
Rockingham County's Alternative Education. And our theme for this year is, where do we go? Here we are, we have all this wonderful information, where do we go? And as you can see, our very first thing up here is a new logo. We want to rebrand our school a little bit. Um, I go out to the public and I ask for some assistance from Lowe's or whatever, and oh, that's the bad school. No, we're not the bad school. We are Booker T. Washington Learning Center, and we are here to help educate every child. Um, so that's what our goal is this year, to do a little bit of rebranding, plus some other things that I'm going to share with you. Let me see if I can get this working. There we go. Sorry, it's not cooperating. There we go. I gotta put on my glasses to see. So the purpose of Booker T. Washington Learning Center, um, our mission is to offer an alternative education setting with a safe and nurturing environment. A lot of the students that come to us, they may not come from a nurturing environment. They may come from a family that has discourse at home. Um, and so our staff is dedicated to make sure that every child is loved that comes to the door. No matter what they've done, they've made a mistake. Mm -hmm. But that's not to hold them accountable for the rest of their life for something that they did. And our goal is to try to nurture them and then help them learn from that mistake and not do it again. And learn those critical life values. And that's what we are dedicated to. Every child can learn. Um, they come to us at different learning levels, and we have to differentiate to meet the needs of those students. My math teacher has seven preps every day. She has a lot of work to do. And if she's not doing it because she doesn't love that job, you know, then we need to find something else. But she is dedicated to do that. All of our teachers are. So we maintain high and consistent expectations for both our staff and students, and we commit to adhering to the standard and a structured code of discipline. So the way we do business, um, we go through an extensive orientation process with the family. We are very transparent during orientation. I um, told Dr. Stover before, I'm not a big one for surprises unless it's for my birthday, and that has passed. So I do the same thing with our parents and our families. I want you to understand this is what the expectations are. This is the way we conduct business here. This is how when and how we contact you. If your child does X, Y, or Z, these are what the consequences can be. But if they do A, B, and C, these are what the rewards can be that they can reap from it. So we give them a nice packet. We spend the time with them about an hour going through everything so they know what to expect. We talk about academics. Um, we want, of course, our students to succeed. We had seven students graduate last year through Booker T. Washington, even though they went back to their base schools, which we think that's a great achievement. Um, we have a transition process that we started last year uh, to make sure a smooth transition back to their schools, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, we've started to incorporate SEL lessons, and we're going to do some more with that, and I'll talk about that in a bit. And then, of course, build those positive relationships with families. If we don't have that connection with them, there's no level of trust. And if there's no level of trust, we can't break those barriers down and move forward and do what's in the best interest of the students. So some new things for this coming school year. There's a lot of things I have. Um, I know I have a lot of slides, but I, it's an appendix, so you can check out some of that stuff. Um, but we're going to touch base on the four yellow topics here. Restorative justice program, the revision of our league program, updated transition projects, pr process, and then the ingenuity pilot program, which Dr. Bergen alluded to a little bit earlier. Um, but then in your appendix item, you can see that we've been accepted into a National Alternative Education Association cohort for three years. We're one out of 13 schools in the nation that got accepted into this. Um, we have a revised schedule. We're going to create an advisory committee with community uh, folks that have more community support. And then we're going to have some professional development and big thing, school pictures. They asked why they can't have school pictures. So we're going to try to get that pulled in this year for the kids. Restorative justice. This is our big, I think our capstone for the year. We have already had three days of intensive training with folks that came in um, from the Midwest gave us this wonderful book that has a lot of good information in here. Dr. Corcoran helped us find this free resource. So they're going to come and even do training with the students in the beginning of October. 
and they're going to meet with our staff uh, once or twice a month as well um, to just check in see how things are going restorative justice um, touches on several things it touches on accountability responsibility and building the, uh, the community um, community buildings amongst the family at the school and with the kids um, it makes them reflect and think I this is what I did. This wasn't correct. These are other things we can do. Guess what? Mr. Rice has did stuff before that he's gotten in trouble for. I'm not going to give them all the details, but <laughs> you know, none of us are perfect. We have all done something. And so when we do our restorative circles with the students, we become vulnerable also and let them know, hey, we're not perfect. We understand what's going on. Let's all work and talk together through these circles. And once we get them going, we'd like to invite you all to come maybe participate in the circle as well to kind of see how that works. Um, they're really, really exciting, um, the ones that we have sat in. And we've had even staff members cry during their circle because they were sharing out important stuff with each other. Um, the goal with the restorative justice is to reduce disciplinary issues and to help improve academic performance because you can use the restorative circles for academics as well. So we're real excited to figure out how that's going to work. We're going to talk with the folks. Um, we're going to have a Zoom meeting with them soon to talk more about the academic piece incorporating in once we get the initial disciplinary ones going. Our league system, uh, we've been incorporating a league system for about two years now. And it's kind of like league score is a baseball type acronym, which means second chance opportunity resource education, second chance. So our league system was put in place kind of as a point system to, for kids to have goals and make milestones. And as they made them, we did celebrations for them. Um, but if they didn't make it, they had to step back a little bit and maybe sometimes start again. Well, with our league system this year, we're revising where students have to earn so many points to move through the leagues and they have to complete certain tasks. Um, so in League 3, a task is they're going to have to do some community service, three hours of community service. Uh, they're going to have to complete so many SEL lessons in each one. They have to um, participate in the, um, the restorative circle. So, and that's in your appendix, you can see that. As students earn their points, then they will move through the leagues, 25 points a day. And you can see on the second one here how to league up. Whenever they get 400 points and they have met the requirements under league number one, they request a meeting with me. And I call their parents, the parent can come in, and we have that conversation. Hey, I've accomplished these goals. I've made this many points. I've done X, Y, and Z. Been great. Okay, we're good. Let's league you up. Or, you know, we didn't quite master this one. Let's see how we can work and help you get that so you can move up, request another meeting, and move up again. Um, teachers will not take points away from them. They will be administrative deductions. So I don't want the teachers to be seen like they're the, you know, the ones out to get the kids all the time. Um, so I, I put that on top of me administratively. If we get a speeding ticket, we usually have to pay fine, right? But they don't take our whole paycheck. So we're not gonna take all their points. So you can see if they get OSS, it's gonna be 15 points instead of the whole kit and caboodle. So just kind of structured a little bit. And that's for accountability. We still have to be accountable for our actions and what we do. Um, but we will then have milestone rewards. So as students make progress, we want to celebrate those um, milestones for them. So maybe a homework pass or a classroom activity. We do some sort of PBIS over at Booker T. Washington. So it could be tied in with our PBIS. We're going to work revamping that a little bit this year. Um, we've had pizza parties, movies, Christmas tree decorating. So just some little things that the kids like to do. But we want to celebrate their successes, too, because they can do whatever they set their mind to, and that's what they're trying to help them get to. Our transition process, um, again, this is something that we've worked on, and we started to implement it this last uh, semester, and it's been very successful, well received by the principals. Um, we create, we have students create a PowerPoint presentation. And there's a list of questions here. I'm not going to go over all of them with you. But again, it's to get them thinking, what, what did I do that was wrong that got here? What if I made that choice when I was out of school and had a job? What could happen? Who has this affected besides me? What's another choice I could make so if I'm 
face of that again, I'm not in the same boat that I can make that right choice. Try to make them think about what's going on. They present this to myself, my counselor, and then the principal at the base school where they're returning to, the counselor there, and then possibly if they're in special education, we have the special ed teachers there as well. It's a team. And we ask questions back and forth with the students and have a conversation. Some of the pictures that you see up there are our students actually doing presentations. I did have a video, but it was a little hard to get transferred over. Um, so it, it, we're just trying to make it more of an inclusive decision for the students going back and make sure they're prepared and ready to go back. I love my kids. I love them to death. But I tell them, please don't come back unless you're coming to visit me. Let's not come back as a student. And, uh, you know, so far we've been doing pretty well with that. I'm very pleased with our students. <coughs> and Edgenuity, this is my last piece I'm going to talk about just because of time. Um, so Edgenuity, uh, I've gone to several conferences and over 50 LEAs in the state use this program. Um, they are very pleased with it. They use it for original credit, credit recovery, um, you know, what, whatever they need to. Um, use it for. So it has a lot more options in this program, in this platform. There's test prep materials that they can use to prepare for their EOCs, um, for ACTs. There are SEL lessons. There's over, I counted, 135 SEL lessons that we can utilize with our students that um, just range a gamut of different discussions in different areas. Um, the courses, there is not just our basic courses, but there's also Latin, French, Chinese that's in there. There's CTE courses, which I don't want to take away from Ms. Wall CTE, but for us where we don't have a lot of CTE options, that gives us more things that we can offer our kids instead of them just sitting there, we're trying to figure out what are we going to do. Because our middle schoolers, you know, middle school does English, math, and then either one semester of science, one semester of social studies. i got to have something else for them. And we do have the Spark Lab, but that's for high school kids. So what do I do with my sixth grader? So this will give us some of those options where these kids can do some things that are much more meaningful. Um, so, and then it has, in the platform, it has guided notes, um, which there's an example right here of guided notes that they can go in as the lesson's going on, they can fill them in. Apex is, here it is, you read it, you answer the question, move on to the next. This has actual teachers that were recorded in studio teaching the lesson and content to the kid. It takes it and it chunks it down into smaller bits instead of just one whole big thing. So I think that's important for our students for learning. They get it in the smaller pieces and they can grasp it. If they don't understand, they can go back and watch it again. There's a transcript on the side that they can read. It'll show closed captioning. It'll even translate into another language. And that is very good for our, student, our Spanish students. Now, I, I don't know if it'll completely translate the, what they read. They can read it in the translation. Um, but it's, it's a great program. I spoke with um, some of my colleagues down at Rowan Salisbury that have been using this um, for several years, and they're really excited you know, that we are bringing this on board as well. Um, so I hope this will be a, a good pilot for us and something that we can use to benefit all of our students here in Rockingham County. And finally, my last little piece, I put some pictures up here. I love pictures. And this is our, this is our family. We are a true family there. Um, some of the pictures, you can see Mr. Wynn has taken students outside on Earth Day. Um, we have a little trail so they can do some things out there. We have students who are making dirt for Earth Day. Um, but if you one thing you notice across them all, they're smiling. Several of you have come to our holiday breakfast that we had or to the ribbon cutting for the spark and has said, look how well behaved these kids are. They need this spark lab because it's giving them something to do. Look how they're acting in here. And that's one thing we pride ourselves on. First quarter last year, I had no suspicions, no discipline. And we pride ourselves on that. And that's our goal, is to try to minimize, hence using the restorative justice, minimize the amount of discipline that we have in the school. Do we have discipline? Yes. Do we have to follow structure? Yes. And it's there. But 
what can we do now to help those kids? Because sometimes they don't respond to suspension. So that's what we're hoping this restore to practice and some of these other things in the leagues of them earning points and earning their way back will help them out to be better citizens here for us. I have a quick question. If, when they're ready to go back to their home-based school, mm -hmm. what is the procedure and what, are, what do you go through to inform the home school exactly where they are when they return and for the, home school? For the so, transition? So as we get to that point, um, I send out a letter to the home school and say these students are on track to return on such and such a date. And I put the student's name and I send that to the school. And then I send out a um, Google Sheet and we set up a time to have our transition meeting so they can come physically to our school. Okay. And I, um, I don't prefer to do those on Zoom because it's a lot of dead time and it's just, it shows the kid that they're vested in them coming back as well. And it builds, starts to build those relationships. So we set up the meetings for them to come back to the school. The student works on the presentation. Uh, Miss Doss will review it with them. My English teacher will review it with them as well. Um, and we just get them all set up and prepared so they can present and not be too nervous. Okay. Uh -huh. okay sounds good. Any other questions? Huh. Like I said, I got a lot of things in the appendix. I hope you take time to look at that. And please, please, please feel free to come over and visit us anytime. Anybody is welcome anytime. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. That was a great presentation. It certainly was. Thank you so much. Do we have any committee reports tonight? We don't, I know we don't have safety. I, I have one for Did finance. You, okay. If you want me to read that real quick. That's so great. On, on Monday, July 8th, the Finance Committee met to discuss the year in close for the 23-24 school year and address some areas of concern for the 24-25 school year. The actual amount of local fund balance ending June 30th, 2024 will not be finalized until our external audit is completed by the end of October. However, we estimate that going into the school year, we will have a local fund balance amount of approximately $3.3 million. With the additional local appropriation of $3.25 million from the county commissioners, we anticipate the need to appropriate at least $1 million of fund balance to maintain our payroll and general expense needs for the 24-25 school year. It is very important for us to monitor our budget and prepare for the 25-26 school year now. Our state allotments will be reduced in the 24-26 due to the decline in student enrollment. We must prepare for these reductions in state funding now so that we can preserve our local fund balance for one-time expenses rather than recurring expenses. During our meeting, we also discussed the need to increase our teacher supplement and address the compression of the classified salary schedules as we develop our budget request for the 25-26 school year. The date of our next meeting will be Thursday, August the 22nd. The time is yet to be determined, and I believe that will be announced tomorrow. Is that right? Yes. Any Thank you. questions about that? Any other reports? Okay, Dr. Stover. Good evening again, board members. Um, I want to focus on the superintendent's report is to talk about um, the uh, grant that we uh, received competitive grant we received um, and got news of and had a presentation around um, last week. And let me get all the setups so I can play the, play the slides. Okay, let me just enable editing. All right, so I want to take here, I'm, I'm going to do a little bit of a uh, timeline here. Um, one of the first things about two years ago, um, and I can't remember if it was with Miss uh, Dr. Um, Young or uh, Dr. Parks, but um, Jean uh, wanted to be, uh, Kelly came up and said he wanted to be a part of a collaboration of 10 school districts who are applying for uh, energy efficiency grant the Department of Energy was releasing. Um, and I said, that sounds great. And we applied. Um, we were not, we, were, we did not receive that grant. Um, last year. This year he came up to me again with Miss Young and said, 
we're going to work with Johnson Controls. We want to apply for this grant again. Um, and I think we even went over some of like, you know, it's there's this much money. It was about 150 or so million available. And we think a lot of people are going to apply, but it doesn't hurt to apply. I said, that sounds like a great idea. Uh, then fast forward to the um, 29th of July. I was actually meeting with Ms. Rakestraw um, and Ursel pops up, Ms. Young pops in the office and says, we just got notification that we uh, received the grant. I'm like, wow, okay. We got more information about it and um, they actually chose us to come and make the announcement. We didn't know the amount of the grant or the possible award um, even on the 29th. All we received is that um, we're gonna make an announcement and we wanna do this in Rockingham County. It was on August 1st that we received the possible amount, how much we got. Um, and it was embargoed though until the 5th of August. So we couldn't say this is what we could possibly receive. Then we had the announcement on the 6th and moved forward from there. And so that's how this all came about. Um, and we're really excited and we're grateful for the partnerships that we have. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the grant. Um, as you can see, uh, what we've received that we, we know we're gonna get is $300,000. Um, we were one of, I think, 16 districts that received that. And then I think three or four other districts received just the 300,000. We're part of the cohort of uh, districts that are then um, eligible to move on to phase two and phase three of the agreement. And this is where, until we actually got the grant and talked to the Department of Energy, we were a little unclear. But our whole part of the grant was, we're not gonna spend any money, and we haven't identified any projects yet. Only thing we've identified are the 12 schools we can do projects with. Um, in order to get the 500,000 and the 7 million, we actually have to work with our community. So we have to collaborate with the county commissioners. We have to collaborate with the town of Maiden, um, um, Madison, Eden, Reedsville. And so that is one of the requirements that we have in order to receive the grant money. That wasn't 100% clear to me when we received the grant because again, my participation, my contribution to this grant was to say, that sounds like a great idea to me. Um, and so I had some learning to do once we get it. I, we were kind of like the dog that caught the car. Um, and so um, we're, we're happy. And I have my friends here um, that are with me that are going to do a probably much better job explaining this whole um, community cooperative agreement part of the grant. So we have representatives from Johnson Controls along with Jane Kelly. And I'd like to invite them up here to kind of talk about that aspect of the grant. So there's good evening. There's there's a uh, there's a big difference than uh, the application last year than the application that we had this year, and so I guess they wanted to streamline the process. They understood, you know, last year we picked certain parts of you know the schools and, and things that we wanted to do there. Uh, this year that part is in phase number two, so we haven't identified anything that we haven't assessed yet to be able to accomplish at these particular schools. Only the 12 schools is what we have. And that's the difference between uh, this year and the previous year. So we're moving on to phase two. And um, I, I don't know exactly what to say other than we're working with the community. I have uh, over 25 letters of support uh, from the town of Eden, I mean, from the city of Eden, city, city of Reedsville, uh, town of Maiden, town of Madison, uh, folks that listened to me the previous year that I brought over to this year to apply for this uh, this particular loan. Also, too, or particular grant, excuse me. Also, too, uh, this year was super important that we pick an ESCO. An ESCO is an energy service company to be a partner with so that we could move forward. I can imagine that they did this to help us streamline the, uh, the effectiveness of what we're, what we're trying to do through the various phases. And so we don't have to actually go pick that. And so, uh, Kim, I, I, if you'd like to uh, you know, add your part and, 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 and what they did to help us uh, get this grant together so that we could 
be in this position that we're in right now. And I will say, Dean did a tremendous job in working on this grant application. I know when actually talked to Gene last year um, because that was the first year for the renew. This is a five-year program, so this is year two of five years that the federal government is providing this Renew America Schools grant. And so last year, I can tell you, um, there were a thousand school districts that applied. Um, Johnson Controls last year, we submitted 38 concept papers. So the process was a little bit different last year. And so I had actually talked to Gene, given our relationship, and said, hey, have you looked at the Renew America Schools grant? And he said, yes, I've actually partnered with a consortium to do the grant. And I said, well, I said, if you don't win it this year, let's look at it for next year, because I think you guys could get the money all for yourselves, if possible. And so we kind of planted that seed last year. But, um, and so then that's where my great contribution came in. <laughs> <laughs> and so just, so just so you understand, so there were 38 concept papers. Um, out of that, 17 were encouraged to move forward. And I think Gene said his consortium was encouraged to move forward. So we actually did um, uh, 17 uh, total applications. Out of all the applications that Johnson submitted, we won one. So we saw, wow, that was a lot of work. A lot of work. <laughs> a lot of work. And we had some success, but not as much as obviously we're hopeful. So this year, we said, we're not going to spend. We're going to really be very particular on the projects we go after. And so I actually um, said we would like to do this with Rockingham. This is a client we've worked with for years, um, brought our grant writer in. And, um, and so this year, we actually, there were um, 126 applications across the country uh, compared to 1,000 from last year. But the DOE, when they came in, they actually said they touched more schools and more kids this year, even though the count was down. Um, so out of those 126, only 16 got awards. So Johnson this year, we submitted three applications and actually all three of our districts won something. One just, um, we did one with Hope County Schools and they got the prize. Um, and then we did one with Canton County Schools in Ohio and they are a prize winner or they actually are a grant recipient potentially there's still a lot of work to be done as as Jean said because really the next phase you know the district has won three hundred thousand dollars which is the prize money um and that's pretty much you've got to submit paperwork and we're in the process of making sure we get all the paperwork in line and then from there you have to basically um, phase two is a strategic plan which is part of the community action plan so it involves all of the community stakeholders and so we will be soliciting input from, from you, from the county commissioners, from all of the local communities. Um, and then there is a, basically an ASHRAE level two investment grade audit that is part of that phase two along with a strategic plan. So how do you want to basically take advantage of these funds? You know, the goal around it is energy efficiency. So, the goal is that there will be savings associated with these projects. So you're taking your seven million, it's gonna be worth more money to you because you're gonna actually see savings in your utility spend um, and, and basically be investing in your facilities. And the facilities that were chosen were chosen because of the way the federal government, um, they look at what's called disadvantaged communities and DACs. And so when you pull it up on the federal government website, there were 11 schools within Rockingham County that qualified as disadvantaged communities, and that's how that selection was made. Um, and then we added Holmes Middle School because we knew that that was a school that needed some significant renovations, and so we included them on the application so that we could include them as part of the project. And that's where the 12 schools came from. Um, it was really the guidelines put out by the federal government and, and that's how it was selected. So honestly, when we submitted the grant application, it was a, we knew long it was a long shot. Long shot. <laughs> you know, and you know, we did our due diligence because, you know, because it's a lot of work on both of our parts. I can't tell you, when Jean. Well, you know, it, 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 it involves bringing the community in. And, and when RCC mentioned, you know, their, their level up program, I mean, we're, we're like, 
it's parallel exactly. with what we want to do. Part of our program is not only uh, bringing any energy efficiencies to our infrastructure, to our students, better air, better facilities, but also to reach out to our community and offer opportunities for our students. Right. And so that's why uh, Nina Walls was contacted uh, because I knew she was a part of Rocket Top in our CTE program. That's why RCC, uh, you know, uh, the principal at, at early college was contacted so that we could just kind of premise that that relationship that we're about to build. And uh, Dr. Salinger, uh, I contacted her, and got got her support, and so from RCC, she's uh, vice president of student development over there, and various other people in the county. Sam Page, um, the town of Madison, uh, Mayor um, Mayor Lake, um, mm -hmm. uh, Mayor Phillips. You, Mayor here in uh, uh, Reedsville. So these people are crucial to our effort to bring about a, a, an, a, something that's really just going to affect the entire county, more importantly, our students. And so. And, and the CTE program is part of the application, as part of the community action plan, the workforce development. Um, I mean, that's an initiative that Johnson Controls has going on corporately is workforce development because we need trades people to, to help run our business as well. And so we actually have partnered with community colleges across the country and set up labs, HVAC labs, so that, you know, the students can learn how to operate the equipment and learn about the HVAC industry because they're, they're great paying jobs, but you have to educate students to what's out there. And so that's a big premise of this grant as well. And so all the stuff they were talking about, we're like, this is like perfect. This is perfect. <laughs> this is perfect. <laughs> for what we're looking and to do. What a great opportunity <laughs> for Rockingham uh, County. A, a wonderful county that, you know, I mean, out of 16 uh, entities across our nation to be recognized, uh, to be able to get this grant to help better our situation here. And that's the bottom line. It's about our students. It's about our county. We've created, we nick, uh, we didn't nickname this, but we've created this as the uh, Rockingham Green Alliance because there's so many people here that, that support, that, that their support letter was a part of our application. And so we, we can do so much. Uh, yeah, there were two components. One was a technical narrative, which really discussed the needs within each of the facilities, the age of the facilities. So there was a technical narrative that had to be submitted and then there was the community action plan that had to be submitted as part of the grant application. So there were really two significant components that made up the grant application. And so from there, the next phase and the DOE will be assigning somebody to oversee, a project manager per se, to oversee this whole process to make sure, um, it's very, you know, obviously it's federal funding, so it's very similar to the ESSER funds and um, to the other funding that has come out through ARPA, this is actually part of the, um, the, um, uh, the bill, which is the bipartisan infrastructure law. Yes. Um, so that's where the funding is coming from, but it's all part of, and so the requirements around the funding is very similar to Davis-Bacon and some of those things that you have to follow when you do the ESSER funding. So it's all the federal guidelines, but we'll be following all of that, and there will be a resource from DOE that will be help facilitating the process moving forward. As yes, well. they're, they're they're not leaving us; they are with us, and they're actually we're partnering with the DOE, and and every phase, every point. You know, you should see uh, Ms. Young in my my uh, inbox from the DOE. I counted sixty-seven interactions with them since uh, the sixth. And so, it, um, so, so we we're keep on learning more and more. And yes. as we learn more, we're going to share it with the board. Um, and I just want to address a couple things, and then we'll take any questions. I've already told them what they, if, if I start going down the wrong path, they're going to come up and, and correct me. They're going to say, perhaps I can be of some assistance here. So we'll see how I did. One thing I wanted to point out is if you look at um, who was approved this year, um, not many school districts were. So you see right here in the West, there were a lot of LEAs, cooperative, kind of the, the first grant opportunity that we pulled, that we were a part of, right? Um, 
Pittsburgh. And so I think it's something we should be really proud of um, that it, when you narrow it down to just single L school districts that received this prize, we did really well. And uh, for the size of our district and the amount we're getting, it's, it's, it's if you, let me go back some, you can see that the amount of the prize was dictated by how many facilities that you were going to work with. And so um, I, one of my colleagues at Richmond uh, received um, the highest prize, right? Um, and he, but he has 20 plus school facilities that are in need. So that's where it is. The one thing I want to make sure that I emphasize that wasn't really clear to me until today, quite frankly, was this is um, a community based and that we're going to work with people. We haven't decided what we're going to do, luckily yet, but we have our plan where we have a lot of energy efficiencies um, work in that plan. So we will pull from that as, as, as one of our main guides. And then I want to make sure I real quickly address the cost share because there's a 5% cost share um, in order to get the 500,000 and a 25% cost share in order to get the 7 million. We're very familiar with the concept of cost share and it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to um, share costs through projects. So for instance, for phase two, we'll take a portion of Mr. Kelly's salary and use that as our cost share. Um, and, and we'll do things like that. Okay. Uh, which we've done before, you know, the, 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 you know, maybe even a portion of mine if I look at it. We do everything we can so we can maximize the actual award that we're doing and not use funding for new funding or different funding. What can we use for cost share? What well, that would be a great any question, but we can use things like salaries, we can use um, uh, like facilities, the share of facilities we, we use. We can use donations, uh, donations and equipment. That's right. Uh, supplies, uh, space. Uh, we can use in-kind donations. We can use cash donations, which would be, uh, I guess, part of my salary. Uh, that, that's what <laughs> and those payments, look, those that, they don't leave our county. They're implemented right here. We're just notified by the DOE they see how much that is and, and how much that cost share is uh, when we're asking for the for the uh, reimbursement for uh, the actual 500,000 and, and the 7 million. So it doesn't leave our county. And, and so that's what we've been talking uh, with the, with the DOT, DOE team about. And the other thing, and so the 25% the cost share, we would go into our facilities plan and and probably and we would figure out what is the share that the county is going to kick in that we've already agreed upon and what is the share that the federal government does what this practically does for us it gives us more flexibility and it makes the money that we are going to use um, that we are already going to use for energy improvements at these schools that are already on our facilities plan it makes it go a little further and it could possibly allow us to accelerate some programs that were later down the list or not actually involved in energy itself and so it, it's just a nice way for us to add to um, our work we've done for facilities and have more bang for our buck and see faster improvements in our schools so we'll take any questions that you may have from here. We provided some other slides to you um, that, that explain the uh, slide a little bit, but um, those, this was the money slide for me. Any questions? Comment. Yeah. It, it was good to hear that it was part of a bipartisan mm -hmm. effort. There's so little takes place in our country today that is bipartisan. Amen. We actually looked at who voted for it from North Carolina, and then we did have some bipartisan voting from our congressional delegation, um, both Republican and Democratic, that did vote for the infrastructure plan. So I have a couple of questions. I, I just for clarity purposes, I guess, really too. Um, so we've we've gotten the three hundred thousand. I've heard you say that. So it it made it something that y'all said made me think that we don't necessarily get the seven point eight until we've gone through the strategic plan process. Okay, and so and that's where we've got to have buy in from the community and that sort of thing. And and I and I appreciate the work that Johnson Control. I appreciate the work that Mr. Kelly has done on this uh, on this grant. I, my I'm curious as to 
please do not take this wrong. I'm just curious as to how, why the, I know we don't have to approve, but, um, you know, during the time that you all were writing this grant, maybe it's just because you and Ms. Young did not have full information. I don't know. But, you know, the facilities committee was meeting during, during that time. So that would have been a great opportunity for us to have had some at least some discussion so that we could have shared that as well as discussion with our county commissioners because my concern is so when I first heard about it my concern was that that full 25 percent had to come from within our county from our local budget right but what I'm hearing you say is that that could that's that it can come from other things yes. from rather than our county commissioners right. but I mean to be realistic a 25 percent cost share of seven million dollars that's not jump change um, and so we're gonna have to have it but the way we envisioned it is that it would cover from a uh, coming from existing projects that we already planning to do that we have funding from we just have to show that there was a cooperation that we're not just using this is the only sole source of money is really what the point is, is that we are also putting in some effort. Think about the COPS grant. We received three COPS grants. It's the same principle, that we're just not using, that we have some skin in the game, that we believe that energy efficiency is important. And the nice thing is that we already have a plan and we've identified plenty of projects to meet our 25% cost share. So what we would be doing is, um, and this is where we have to get with the Department of Energy to make sure we did this the right way in our finance team, is we'd say this much um, from what we've already approved is coming from the county, and we're going to use this much from the um, potential grant, if that makes sense. So let's take one of the things is windows. Let's say we're going to replace windows at some point. We can say that this much of the project is coming from our local sources, our county, right? And then we're going to use you know, a million dollars from the grant funding or 500,000, whatever it is, to get our cost share. And as long as we can show that 25% of the money is coming from local sources, then we're going to move forward. Now, to answer your question, I, from my thing personally, as I said, my contribution was this, and that was about it. I, I really, I forgot about it. You know, I didn't, because we thought it was such a long shot for us to get, and we had applied before and we didn't get it. And so um, we were very surprised. We, as I said, we were kind of like the dog that caught the car uh, when we had this announcement. And, and you're right, in hindsight, it would have been great to say, hey, we have this opportunity to the board, could have easily done it in board matters. Um, it wasn't an act of commission. It really was an act of omission because I did not get in the weeds for this grant. What I, what I get in the weeds for is what are we identifying as priorities for our district. So that's fair. Um, you know, we had that um, opportunity to share, and we did. Um, we'll know better next time. That's all I can say. We, it took us about a little, maybe a month, uh, to get you know the grant to the point where it was to submit off before the 13th of June. Right. Oh, okay. I mean, that's great. Jane, how realistic is it that we can meet the 25% with existing uh, projects? Well, I, I don't know if I'm the best expert to, uh, to answer that. Right. Uh, I, I do believe that uh, with what uh, Dr. Stover has just uh, mentioned, that's, that's a possibility. The only uh, stipulation that we, uh, that we have to make sure that we understand is that it can't be uh, money from a government, from the federal government source. Okay. And so that money has to be, it, it has to be, money. I guess, state or local, local okay. source. Yeah. And it would be from our sales tax money. We have our facilities uh, plan, which is a living document. But for instance, one of the things that we have, and I know Ms. Young is up here, yeah. we have HVAC uh, improvements um, in the uh, plan, just in general for regional mm -hmm. high school, right? Sure. And also for homes as well uh -huh. and so you just take those two things we easily get our 25 percent match from those things that we have already communicated with uh, the county commissioners on and our facilities committee to get that 25 percent match okay that sounds good yeah <laughs> and what we would love to see is with the projects <clears throat> that we do have that fall under hvac the rooms what we would love to see then is we have an amount that has been approved in our capital funding plan and then 
what we would like to see after the 7.8 plus the match, we'd love to see or go back to the commissioners and ask for funds to be moved to other projects for other schools that aren't within that 12 or the 11 that are on that map. Okay. Plus one. Right. So while there's a, a direct benefit to these 12 schools that we identified that met the criterion that the government had established, there's a very clear indirect benefit because we've already done the planning work for our old facilities that again allows us to shift money that we have been, we were planning on spending on the urgent because you know, HVAC, uh, energy improvements that save us money, they go higher on our list um, as they should. This gives us, you know, this is a great gift that allows us, as I said, to accelerate and maybe reprioritize some of the things we've already planned on doing. I'm, I'm, I'm better about the grant now. I caught off surprised. Yeah. Had plenty in the grant. It says that we had the backing of the Board of Education and the county commissioners. The county commissioners learned about it August 6th also. It had been nice. You know, besides Sam Page's letter, to see a, see a letter from the Board of Education yeah. and from the County Commissioners. Um, we don't like surprises. Yeah. Told you that several times. Um, walk into the school and there it is. Um, just, just a little spice, a little disappointed that we were not informed. How, how long do we have to write the strategic plan? I don't think I got that. Something do we have for the strategic plan? Yeah. Uh, oh, well, well, uh, they said anywhere between uh, I guess uh, now and 120, 120 days. days before they even God, get us ready to be able to move into uh, phase two. So we, the answer is we don't know quite yet. Uh, but when they have <laughs> That's what I heard. To tell us when that happens. <laughs> and as soon as we learn, we will we'll communicate to both you and the county commissioners. Yeah. Just and Johnson I mean, Controls will like be helping with that, right? Exactly. exactly. We'll be using their expertise. And not only Johnson Controls, but I have to emphasize yeah. that we have a counselor at the Department of Energy who will be looking and scrutinizing everything that we're moving through. And so we won't move until they say everything is in order and that we can move and that everything is proper. And I feel like we, 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 we're we ahead of the game because we have our facilities. Exactly. exactly. And so when, when I hear 120 to, days, I'm like, oh, no, we need to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. We're at the, the federal government moves at the speed that the federal government moves. There is a script in the uh, community uh, uh, community plan. And if you read it carefully, it says, it says that these are the stakeholders in the county and that we'll be working with you to try to, to secure, uh, you know, uh, certain agreements on what we're going to do at particular schools. So it didn't say that we got, you know, you're definitely notified, but you're the stakeholders and that you will be a part of, of this effort. And then for the board, you know, as with, with letters, I signed for the board and so, you know, the board notification was on me and again, we, we, you know, we signed a lot of grant letters saying we'll do this. We signed grant letters for RCC to indicate our support. And this is, again, one I just did not think we were going to get. But um, that, we won't make that mistake again, Mr. Butler. Thank you. Can I ask a couple of questions? So I noticed in the grant, Mr. Kelly, that, um, they were they identified i believe it said 75 million was it million dollars in deferred um maintenance i thought our facilities committee was told um i believe in a presentation that um that our previous superintendent done there was a 46 million dollar deferred maintenance right. so what stood out to me was just that it was so much that it was so much greater than what we were given. I don't, uh, I don't, I'd have to look at that one. Okay. Yeah. Well, I can speak to that a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So when we did the investment grade audit as part of the performance contract, we identified that $46 million worth yes. of need then. If you look at the cost of construction, so we kind of said, if you look at that $46 million, that was identified back in 2017 and now you put it in today's dollars, it's almost probably, you know, 70 or $80 million worth of me. So we didn't back, go back and do a, another audit, but we know that based on what's been done, that it's just everything's escalating because cost of construction has escalated dramatically. 
Okay. Well, I just uh, thank you for clarifying that because I heard Dr. Shaver. Um, Somebody was talking about, I know we've got a couple of gyms in the district, like high school gyms that do not have air conditioning, um, but one of those high schools is not identified. Um, I noticed that, um, and I've heard I've heard them talk about windows. Windows have not been given to us on our, we've asked for a comprehensive facility needs plan. Um, windows are not on our plan. Um, so I just sort of wondered where some, how some of those projects got identified. And, we haven't identified any projects for this scope yet okay. at all. So with okay. a, a, an ASHRAE level two audit is required mm -hmm. for that phase two. You can see strategic plan and energy audits. Yes, ma'am. So, I mean, we're familiar because we did the investment grade audit, but that was across the district. I think there were only three schools maybe we didn't look at yet mm -hmm. during, just because some of those schools were requested at that time. But this one obviously yeah. focus on these 12. Um, but as Ms. Young said, you know, with this funding coming in and funding that you identified, you might be able to take some of that other funding and spread it to those other schools because you're going to be able to fund some of these to needs. The other through the and that'll be great. I have one more Can question. I, I, have, I have to say one more thing. Yes, sir. Windows. The, um, one of the reasons that when that was one of the things we could spend on. Okay. So we, we and, and I think a lot of this miscommunication came from the uh, when we did the tour around. So we pointed out, like, for instance, we don't have a HVAC in the gym in Reedsville and it gets really hot. But we also pointed out we don't have HVAC in the hallways in Reedsville either, and that this part of the building, we've, we've addressed this part of the building with new HVAC, but this part of the building, it's, it's, it's reached its useful life, and we have to address that. And then, you know, on the TV, we show the, the windows that, that were not energy efficient. So I think some of that came from that, but okay. the fact is, is that we are gonna work with our community to identify those things that we need. So I just, I mean, just in talking about the HVAC at Reidsville, I think that um, one of the facility, one of the updates that we have, there's like nine point, I think it's nine point seven million or nine point four million in HVAC work for Reidsville, but the gym still not identified separately. Like they identify the office building, the cafe, the um, the old, we have, the nine hundred building. We do have um, phase different phases yes ma'am and so you are correct there and I do want to go back to the windows the windows that is an allowable charge or an allowable repair but also when we talk about Holmes Middle School and in our facilities plan and our prioritization list um, for Holmes Middle School you know, we have all of the air conditioners in the windows. So what we would want to do as part of our plan, and it would be an allowable cost within the Department of Energy, but we would want to upgrade those windows to energy efficient windows and put in an HVAC system. That makes sense. Um, that makes that sense. Would be wonderful. That makes sense. Yeah. Yes. Um, and, and those are questions that we, you know, so I think what happens is, is um, perceptions reality for some people, right? Mm -hmm. So there's been lots of things that have been put out there and lots of assumptions made, I think, by folks. And then we have received lots of questions that we're unable to answer. Um, but I, we really do appreciate, we really do appreciate the work. And we're so thankful that we'll be able to, you know, get some of those other things that are further down on the list that we know need to be bumped up. I mean, those are hard decisions to have to make who gets what when. Um, but I do have one more question, if y'all don't mind, and you might not be able to answer this. But I did notice that there's um, DEI language in the grant. And I know that um, here in North Carolina, even some of our universities have sort of shot away from some of that. So I know that for the district itself, some of that's going to be, I mean, we even have that in policy. So, but what about um, implications for our teachers, for our students, and for our families? Are there any, any implications or anything that has to... So, to try to uh, put this in perspective, we accepted ARPA funds, and under that, that's the American Rescue Plan Act. Okay. And to be very transparent, ESSER funding. And the same 
language was there. Yeah. And in order for us to address that, it talks about the workforce. And just looking even at our county's budget, part of the way that they address the workforce, they have community libraries. They have computers set up where you can search jobs. For us, the biggest thing for us is our CTE, the RCS way, allowing our students choices to be ready for the workforce. Um, also, there's that energy efficiency part, but we feel like we've addressed that through ESSER and I, honestly, I feel like we, as a school district, address these areas on a daily basis by offering opportunities for our students to go to work, not be homeless, um, be, be a viable citizen. Yes, ma'am. So the way I read the grant is that where the DEI comes in, it was also the selection process, right? So where we where we located in like a highly impacted school. So it's a much broader idea of DEI, which is what I embrace. Not that it's 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 trying to call winners and losers for any group. It's you know where is there inequity in funding because of lo local funding circumstances, economic uh, realities of the area where we don't have the same tax base as, say, Guilford County. Yeah. That's the diversity that I read into it. Okay. And also, with our procurement process, we address this on a normal basis as well. We look at our minority businesses, the women-owned businesses, and so we would be addressing the veterans as well. That's really the focus That's of, the, of the initiative yeah. and the grant is really around using minority contractors where possible, um, um, engaging, you know, trying to help with the labor and workforce education, and then actually the students, you know, talking about job shadowing and giving them opportunities to um, be engaged in this whole project. Yeah. And as an example, um, Western Rock, when we were upgrading the HVAC system over there, there was a company that had they were it was a disabled uh, company so we do this on a normal basis thank you dr young for clarity of communication going forward make sure that the facilities committee is involved and they know so they can relate to us absolutely and and again that was on us we let me tell you, when we found this out, we were just shocked. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we did not great. think that we would have the opportunity to stand before you talking about $7.8 million. It was, we hadn't got it previously, and it was just, I think it was a shock to JCI. It was a shock to all of us. It was certainly a shock to Mr. Kelly. Good. And to be honest with you, I'd much rather apologize for getting seven point eight million dollars for the district. I apologize for losing seven point eight million dollars for the district for sure. I want to thank Dean Kelly and Johnson Controls and Miss Young. You always last week we called and that's for that photo immediately. You asked all our questions and we appreciate it. And again, as we learn more and we feel like there's something to report, we will. Um, all this is really hot off the presses as of four o'clock. Um, where we got the, from the Department of Energy the packet, the kind of communications packet, so we we're able to uh, put some of these slides and, and make it much more clear. For Do we we still have people sitting on the facilities committee? I mean, I don't our, think we our, have that. our facilities. Yes, committee. that's a function. Any committee is a function of the board. We don't have, the we don't have a can, facilities can committee can anymore. I thought yeah. we hoped that we had one that was. Our school board facility. Yeah, what we had is the joint facilities committee. Now, if you as a board want to establish a facilities committee, like we do with the finance committee, like we do with the policy committee, um, the safety committee, that is certainly available. Bob, what were you just talking about? 
the facilities committee that I was talking about was Paula Kimberly and County Commissioners, right? Yeah. But that's disband. Is that disband? Well, that is that. So again, that committee was the commissioners' committee because after our district went to them and said we have a forty-six million dollar of de you know deficit for deferred maintenance, they were like, you know, what? This is the first we've heard of that. So, so they wanted us to create this plan for replacing HVACs, replacing roofs, and they wanted. Um, they wanted to work with us on how we prioritize those things. Um, so with having this additional money, I would not be shocked if they, you know, wanted to see, I mean, because the truth is, is they're the ones that um, fund, they, they're, they're the funders, they provide the money. If we don't have a grant for HVAC, then they're the ones that are providing the money for that, right? So if we're gonna be moving the money that they have approved, I have a feeling they're gonna wanna hear about that. And I think that that's really um, the whole point in, in hearing board members say, they would have liked to have to have known, um, but I mean, I think that point's been. I'm not trying to. No, no. I'm not trying to be it's, a dead horse. I'm just making so that fair, point. Fair. So I think that um, I would not be shocked at all to hear them say they want to see how much further we could go with this set of plan. I would think so. Yeah. I would think so too. Yeah. And we have, a, for instance, we have a meeting scheduled with Commissioner Hall on Wednesday to kind of go over this with him and we'll share some of the information. And I contacted uh, as soon as I found out some of the specifics. I've already contacted Mr. Metzler. He's in Mexico right now, so he didn't really want to talk to me about this. But he said he was talking about that. Can my uh, facilities, our group, Paula and Kimberly, uh, be at that meeting? Would that be appropriate? It's like getting called into the principal's office. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, um, <laughs> we already yeah, had that once on Wednesday. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll that I... we, okay. Okay. This is a request was... from Commissioner Hall. Okay. Yeah. If he would allow it, I think they would be able to. Give, okay. give give our perspective. That's what we're. We'll do our best, <laughs> Bob. That's what Vicky and Vicky are going to do. Okay. In that meeting. Oh, oh, oh y'all are going to be there you. Wednesday. Okay. Oh, so okay. We represented. Okay. I don't think he realized that. I didn't Thank realize you. that either. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Any other questions? <laughs> um, just on, on the side, uh, we're looking really good on track to have a smooth opening once again. Um, when our kids come back and join us on the 26th. Now we already have some kids that are already there. Um, some of the things, you know, Dillard is a leading indicator for us and some of the things we were worried about, like um, our new student information system seem to be going well. You know, there's always a chance when you get, you know, 20 more schools, 21 more schools back in line, things can happen. But so far, so good, we feel ready and we're excited about an opening, a great opening again this year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go into closed session. Madam, Madam Chair, I'd like to move that the board go into closed session to discuss confidential personal information pursuant to General Statute 143-318.11A1 and 6 and to consult with our attorney to protect the client attorney-client privilege pursuant to General Statute 143-318.11A3. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.